Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to get started. So thank you for coming. Uh, this is Writers and Books uh, Visiting Writers series. Uh, if you're not familiar with Writers and Books, we are a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. Our mission is to promote reading and writing as lifelong activities for people of all ages and backgrounds. Uh, and we do this through readings, uh, workshops for uh, adults and youth, uh, and through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. Um, our, all of our program right now is completely online. So um, you can check us out at wab.org. Um, Tonight, we're very happy to have uh, the poet Lauren Camp. Uh, she's celebrating the release of her new book, Took House. Um, we'll do, um, we'll hear from Lauren, we'll do, we'll talk a little bit, and we'll do some uh, questions from the audience. So uh, at any time, you can hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and submit a question that way, and we'll um, uh, be able to answer it that way. So. Uh, I will also put a link to her book in the chat. Uh, you'll be able to uh, click that and go uh, purchase her book. So, um, yeah, as I said, thanks for coming. Um, and we're glad to have Lauren. As Rebecca Beardsall observed, opening with hunger and appetite, Took House, an alluringly haunting poetry collection, invites the reader to the table to dip in and out of love, obsession, and what remains hidden. The author of five books of poetry, including 100 Hungers, selected for the Dorset Prize and a finalist for the Arab American Book Award, Camp works in the confluence of sound, psychology, and language. Her poems have appeared in the Los Angeles Review, Pleiades, the Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day series, Poet Lore, and elsewhere. Her work has been translated into Mandarin, Turkish, Spanish, and Arabic. In 2020, uh, Camp was selected to be one of the 100 artists and storytellers for 100 offerings of peace. She lives in New Mexico, where she teaches creative writing to people of all ages. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to Writers and Books for the invitation to come and read from my brand new book. The book is, uh, Took House is about a month old and still feels very, very newborn to me. Um, so I, it's very exciting to hold it and to share it. So I'm going to read a sampling of poems from the book. I'm mostly going to just go straight through without much in the way of introduction. And I'm going to start with the very first poem in the book, Appetite. And now in the useless, unceasing, there is a heart in one part of town where there is a table that is most like a cliff a place to render fewer potentials. There is a glass near a bottle that will offer what she asks. In that room or the next is an intimate slowing where the woman put down her shield and took out her heart. She put it on the table and looked at the table under the eye of everything that could go wrong, everything that did each direct chance and the taking of it. Now she tries to explain the way the past wouldn't finish, that the heart was a stipulation, the shade of her hunger, his palm on her marrow. It is the largest muscle and she let it take over. She let it. Find the color of survival. I want to talk about what I believe is beautiful, and this is complicated by all the oil of that year. The muscle of my mind was worn out. I was painting everything at once, painting until the impulse died and began again. I tended to let days scatter to bruises on canvas. 
absolute color, the temperature I tolerated, and my hands the only source of compassion. My eyes stayed on the symbols of other artists' corners and saw as they spread to a world that existed through another parking lot, a skein of grasses. Four shades of green could have and bend the eye. Even in excess, I always see the most trivial details. Even then, I was always sure a return to heaven's brightness. These are the matters for which there are no limits. How far imagination commands, and I splendored over it. I starved to praise, contented in the ways of light and bed and silhouette, because I had sacrificed to muddy palms and art inscribed with truth and the dominion of hues, the breathless blue. I believe you'll see in every image pleasure and 20 different senses, every past in the right and wrong place. So many times no one can tell if they saw us. A woman tying a black apron brought the cutlery to our table. At home, I lifted a broad brush to each sorrow. One day soon, every form will be transparent. But first, with you, I'm looking at even what I cannot stand to see. Flavor. I'd been careful all my life. That day I wore my carmine shirt. Suddenly his jaw, the table, the large room, many hands waiting to offer comfort. Where the walls sang, ours were fine, and the wine lazy, the taste of punishment as strong and sweet as pardon. So Tookhouse has a main storyline, and I've just read you a couple of poems from that. And then it has two other components or elements of, um, of the book that really feed into that storyline. One is ekphrastic poems, poems about artists and artist processes. And the other is poems of raptors, especially uh, the raptors, birds of prey I see in the desert where I live. So this next poem is called Golden Eagle. Nearly silent from the cliff, the great bird unties his wings in curves and rolls through open air. Such searching. He lowers to find flesh, his silhouette obedient to the sky's bewildered blue. Patrol, tilt. In three, two, one, the root turns perpendicular. His narrow, awful face quickens on perishable landscape, everything in the open, pitches and voices, some echoes. He grabs enough for one, ignores the moan. At the table, was I greedy? I hardly ate, only what I needed. There are um, a few poems in Took House that begin, uh, the title begins homeostasis, and I'm going to read one of them. They're sort of poems looking for a kind of balance within the collection, within the story that's being told, or the, the fragments of story that are being, that is being told. This one is called Homeostasis Night. When I can't sleep, I ask you to tell me a story, though I am all grown up. And I listen to what it was like to be a boy that one year in Southern Illinois, how you loved snow and your bike and where your house was at the end of a lane and how you found that house because of a man at a gas station. But then I fall asleep and don't know what happens Next.
So for this reading, I, um, I picked a bunch of poems I haven't read to audiences before. And even though I can't see you, it's sort of exciting to know that I'm reading them out to you. Um, and so this next one is called Hush Again. Wild strawberry had been rising from rocky places. On the street, small boys in red. Above them on poles, some crows. A delphinium, a bartender a hundred times. Failed to joy, I fell a year. No one saw my blurs and constellations. A swirl of streets slurred to summer rain. How many slants of light in the intimate alphabet? I knew them all. Looking back, two chairs and thirsty people, small leftover goals. My tongue still willing to tongue whatever words. So as I said, there are poems about artists and um, art processes. And um, this was a particularly pleasing thing to add into the collection. Well, so were the Raptor poems, honestly, but, um, but this, the art poems were because I spent years and years as a visual artist and I'm fascinated by certain artworks and certain artists, certain mediums. And so it's really nice to be able to go in there and capture some of what they're doing or highlight or lift up some of the artists whose work inspires me, mesmerizes me. So this next poem is inspired by the photography of Annie Leibowitz and the poem is called Best Portrait. In the morning with her largest lens, each frame allows a sudden opening. She climbs the ladder, eyes, shoulders, skin. It is a long walk to the end of a face. In the afternoon, image becomes excursion, the pleasure of finding the shape of a stranger in the curve of a lens. Nothing shelters the shot, no distraction. Each gesture is bundled in whispers, the evening's penitent light and the hard eye of flash leads to rumor. And the picture spills out by itself. Uh, in, so this is my fifth book. In each book, I have this, I have this um, hope that I will put a pantoum in every book. I don't think I've succeeded, but I've, I've mostly succeeded. Uh, Pantum is a, a, I think it's a 13th century Urdu form that repeats, that allows for all kinds of obsessions and things you wanna rethink, you wanna revisit. But also the form is so magical because you have to add in things you didn't expect. So if there's anyone in the audience who has never done a Pantum before, but is likes to write, try, I recommend you try it. Um, but anyway, this is, this is a pantoum. Uh, every line in here repeats and hopefully turns over into something new. It's called, I recommend you not empty of content. When I stood and tore rocks from the edge of our porch, you saw I was otherwise empty of details, of spark. From words to cup to hope, to wake. You called for help. From the edge of our porch, you saw I was otherwise caught in the arch of defeat. No chances to hope to wake. You called for help that day. October was visible in every direction, caught in the arch of defeat. No chances. How many times could we do this? I almost slid off that day. October was visible in every direction, taut, then shaking. Was this on your heart? How many times could we do this? I almost slid off from the place we called home. Pity the riddle, taut, then shaking. Was this on your heart? Your sturdy going on, your exhaustion with the place we called home? Pity the riddle, empty of details of spark, 
From words to cup, your sturdy going on, your exhaustion when I stood and tore rocks. Excavation. We consumed with both hands, tasting the pig or sweet onion, coaxed the raw to our mouths, what had barely begun, the long line of plates. We asked for the sugar then, no, not enough. We asked again in the emptiness. He said, if you drive off forever, the world which was perfect will become various. A motorcycle passed in the hollows of our breathing. Every night, all the language, a terrain not as terrible as the thrashing of meat from our spit. Please, can we have some more fatty questions, a table to the left? How obvious we were. More of the musk of such clutching and where to put his signature in me. As if we had already lost everything we requested, every cream, every greed. My whole body was warm in the mouth, starved for its grief. I would have eaten whatever was most bloody and held my hand to my throat. Equivalent. Witch's broom, a half-broken memory. Formation of ravens as evidence. This is the respite from hesitance and the chance to watch sky thirsting for heartbroken clouds. The ground remains nearly expressionless. The sun has been churning. I type nine goodbyes in a white room. Tomorrow I'll have something in common with those who once lived here. The warm sound of old wounds. The knife upside down in the kitchen, the jawbone on a fence on the hillside, and the man with a shaker of salt. It will all stay the same. Wild horses, a hedge of cobwebs. Now the man with a needle pulling out droplets of blood. The sun lands as ash in the bath. And the last poem I want to read is... Um, is a poem I've never read to an audience. It's one of the earlier poems in the book and it's called Smote. And I wanna take this moment to really thank you for being here, for letting me read to you, for um, coming to Writers and Books virtually, a remarkable organization. Um, I wish we had one in my town. But um, so this last poem is called Smote. Give me your flower, dear. Did you see how I carried my breath in a handbag and peeled off the parts of myself he requested? May I never again need to be so fluent in silk at daylight. Festering boil, disease of the crops. Take handfuls of ashes. Give me the bitter in chances, noon turned to smudges. We sat by the wall, taking desire as treasure to the back of our throats. We had light in Goshen and stream and cloud. May there be blood, the worst hailstorm. Much later, I count these plagues down, how the moon hardly wobbled through vowel on vowel, through window pane, the mountains forgotten, my home full of torment. I confess the small form of my body found sweetness. The sky at my door, the legs of the chair. We weren't yet finished. I was devoured for months. I knew why I had gone. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all the borders. But I made it home through the dust where the sun tumbled in and lifted out as it sometimes does. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was, that was really wonderful. Uh, I, really, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for letting me do it.
Yeah. Um, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to submit through the Q and A. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask you uh, how you put this collection together. Uh, you mentioned kind of three different uh, things, the storyline and the raptor poems and the ekphrastic poems. I just wondering how that all fit together for you. I put it together slowly, very, very slowly. Um, I began the poems in 2005. A lot of the poems that I first wrote are not in this book. Um, they, um, they mostly got trashed. When I, when I write, when some, I only write when something interests me, when something bothers me or something makes me wonder or something makes me um, occasionally when something makes me thrilled, happy, but not very often because I'm too busy being thrilled and happy. Um, but like, and that just doesn't interest me. There's not enough meat to that. Uh, but when I have something that bothers me or niggles at me, I write and write and write and write. And I write tons of really unremarkable drafts. And, um, and so a lot of it gets, uh, gets sort of collaged together or pulled away. I'm not precious with my own work at all for a really long time, um, maybe ever, but really for, for a long time in the writing process and drafting process. So it wasn't until far into it that I suddenly thought um, that I could, add, I knew I needed to add something else, some other elements, but I suddenly figured out what they were. Um, I had my head in the clouds a lot, looking up at raptors all the time, uh, very interested. I'm always very interested about them. And so I just tasked myself with learning, with studying them, studying their behaviors. It felt like a good fit for the other poems, for the main storyline. And meanwhile, I, I really do write ekphrastic poems here and there, and I have a big collection of them. And it was, that was kind of like the, the, um, the sort of the beautiful part of the collection, the part of um, holding, holding the artists and the artwork and, and the fact that there is art in the world was kind of like, oh, I can put this in and this is, this is the, the happier part. So it took, I, I don't know exactly, but it probably took eight or 10 years before I thought to put the other poems in. I was very slow about it. Mm. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, so we have a question here from Allison. Please comment on the collection's narrative voice. Well, so I think there are a few. That's a good question. I, I think it shifts in a few different ways. I think there's a um, there's a voice that's in the middle of it where the storyline is happening in the present. And then there's a witnessing voice. There's a voice that has stepped away and is looking uh, from the outside at what is going on. And that uh, witnessing perspective came in only much later. It was, it, it was, it's, it's my um, recommendation for waiting this long in, or maybe not this long, but a while in writing a book or writing even a poem, because it gives you a chance to step back and add something else and find some different perspective. And i and I did this too with uh, 100 Hungers, my third book, where it also took a really long time and I had to figure out how I was going to come at that story. And really, I think in, in 100 Hungers, um, there were whole poems devoted to that, that um, not exactly a witnessing voice, but sort of that voice that said, I don't know anything. And that's what those poems were about, was acknowledging that. In this case, there aren't whole poems devoted to that, but there, there are uh, mentions of it in a lot of, a number of the poems. Uh, Judy Carr says, a terrific reading. I was wondering if you could comment on the cover. It is intriguing. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, the, uh, so Tupelo Press published the book and at some point they came to me and asked for my uh, preferences for a cover. And I thought I would use one of the artworks by one of the artists whose, write, whose art I had included, who I had written about. Um, really major artists, like 
incredibly known artists and they said they, they basically shut that idea down very quickly and said no we can't afford any kind of copyright permission on that um, which was fine which turned out actually to be a, a very lucky thing for me so I immediately went back to um, what I really like to do is to highlight local artists is to um, to say here I live in a place where the arts are magnificent and all around me um, and and so I started thinking about the artists in New Mexico the artworks I knew and um, not necessarily artists I knew but the cover is by Suzanne Sparge she's an Albuquerque artist I know her a bit I don't know her super well but I've known her artwork for probably a couple of decades and um, and so when I thought of her, I was like, oh my God, Suzanne. And I went to her website and I started poking around. And um, I have to say this book cover, um, the title of the, the artwork is Nest and it, um, she, it's dated 2005. As it happens, I think I told you that the book that I started the poems in 2005, but it is almost like Suzanne took all the poems, put them through her and made this artwork to go with my book. That isn't how it happened, but, um, but I, I could not be more ecstatic about this cover. It's mystery, it's elements, the many elements that I somehow wrote about, that she somehow collaged into her work. It's a mixed media collage with paint. Um, and I guess that's all I'm going to say. I, I'm delighted by it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, question from Kevin Lemaster. Uh, Everything you read has a very significant musicality. When you are writing a poem, do you immediately hear the music or does that come uh, more with revision? Um, hmm. I've never gotten this question before. Hi, Kevin, I'm glad you're here. Um, well, I hear some music maybe immediately. I This is what drew me to poetry. I have written, uh, I was a prose writer, I was a, I was a magazine editor and a freelance writer for, um, for a number of years before I started working in visual art. And I never heard any music in that language. I, I was a capable writer and not, if you ask me, not a very interesting writer, but I could get the things down that I needed to write. Um, poetry for me has a few things going for it. It has negative space, it has music, it has a uh, challenge, <laughs> it's hard, it's work. And all three of those are positive things for me. They're all, they're all things that I deeply admire about it. Um, and they, they sort of all nestle together. Um, it takes work for me to find the shape. It takes work for me to find the best musicality. But there's always some at the beginning. And there's, and, and part of the, uh, part of the time in putting this book together was heightening the the language and the imagery in the book um, and heightening when i say heightening the language through the through the word choice through them through the the sounds as they came together and i might even say um, sometimes it wasn't um, harmonic that i was going for but friction but some kind of discordant sound Um, so uh, last question uh, from Allison. Uh, when do you know you have a collection and not just a pile of poems? Do you write to a project or is your process more organic and evolutionary? Holy heavens, my process is so <laughs> fickle. It's, I, I write one poem. I, I just, I, <laughs> Like, I would love to write a whole project. Um, I did that sort of a little by accident in my fourth book, but I, I go where, where I'm amused, where I'm entertained, where I'm compelled, where I'm bothered. And so that's one poem, one poem, one poem. And I, I am happy to work on a lot of things at once, um, sometimes. I mean, you'd have to ask my husband about that because I complain about it too. But, um, but that means that I kind of create um, partial projects. I, I just, like at some point I'm like, oh, okay, I have 
um, I have enough poems on this subject. Um, I was writing for my third book. I, it ended up being like a project. It was about my father's childhood in Baghdad, but I had no information. So for a long time, it was, it was empty of things. This project had a lot of things going for it, but it had too much going for it. So really it took, uh, how did I know I, I had a collection? I think it took some years away from it um, where I only, um, where I only sort of, sort of fiddled at the outsides of it in a way and said, I don't have to, I don't have to produce something quickly. I can just figure this out. I can just, I could just, like the word I use a lot is marinate. I can just let it marinate. I can just let it sort of settle. Um, and, oh, here's a word that I'd like to work into a poem and I can go back in and I can just take the pressure off. Um, and I, I did that until finally I, I had something I, I liked even when I came back to it four months later or six months later. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, um, this has been great. I really enjoyed it. I hope everyone uh, else enjoyed it. Um, uh, please buy uh, her book uh, at Ampersand Books. The um, link is in the chat. Um, and um, yes, thank you for coming. And uh, thank, you, thank you, everybody. It's been so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone.